Welcome to the Dingometer, where we investigate ways of creating awesome learning experiences and tackle tricky issues in learning design. And today, Phil and I are delighted to be joined by Daniel Perry Reed from Measure Lab. Measure Lab are an independent team of analytics experts who do amazing things with data to help businesses drive growth. And Daniel is an analytics consultant, trainer, podcaster, skateboarder. I think you can see a skateboard on the wall there. <laughs> and an all around data evangelist. <laughs> So back in 2023, Daniel approached Ding about building a course to help people learn about this big switch that's happening to Google Analytics 4, or has happened. Um, and during the, the course build, Phil and I learned a huge amount about Google Analytics, to be honest. And I think, Daniel, you learned a thing or two about learning design through the process. So we thought it'd be quite in, uh, interesting to invite you back onto the podcast to review the experience and just talk about particularly your use of video and, and how you use video creatively on the course. So first and foremost, Daniel and Phil, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Tony. Yeah, right. thanks for having me. Yeah, pleasure, absolute pleasure. Okay, well, let's just let's get straight into it then. So, when you first approached Ding, Daniel, what were your initial ideas about how you would use video? Because I know you you've done a lot of training, you know, you're an experienced trainer, um, but you had this idea. What what was it that sort of in, like created the sparks of that initial idea for using video and creating a video based course? Well, it's, it's an interesting question. I was um, trying to think of that as you were asking, but I don't think I went in thinking videos would be the answer. And I think that's the that's the truth of the matter. I then um, when um when I when I reached out and and to kind of talk to you about building out a um the course, I think it was just a an awareness that I had learned how to do training through trial and error over many many years. And actually, it's a really good opportunity to maybe turn that round and say let's have some professional learning design elements of that. So. I think I went in a bit of an open book and it turned out that video was an effective way of teaching the subject that we wanted to teach. So, and um, and I think that's one of the biggest learning uh, takeaways I've taken from the both of you through this process is that don't dictate the format before you understand what you're trying to teach and maybe let that lead uh, the format rather than the other way around, which is, um, yeah, something that is obvious, but uh, I didn't know at the time. Yeah, that's great. That's a great point because I think it's it's very easy to go into an experience like that with a, a preconceived idea. And certainly, one of the things that we do when we when we build any learning product with people is to try and figure out what's the best route through it for you as the as the client and also for the for the audience as well. So, I suppose just to ask, I mean, it's a daring thing to ask on open air, but how has it been received? I'm hoping after having just finished your next cohort today. I mean, hopefully, it's worked. It has worked. It's been successful. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm always going to be biased and say it's great, it's perfect, it's awesome. Um, but we have uh, we have had some really, really lovely feedback to the point where, like, you know, if you're having a down day, I can open up that Google sheet with all the feedback and just uh, just it just turns that day around. It's yeah, it's it's been received very well. There's um, like anything, it's in perpetual evolution, and we tweak and we adjust and we do that. We don't we haven't kept it static, so we've changed the format up, we've changed the cadence of certain things and some of the um the ways of delivery but underlying that is still the same course and i think structurally and the content especially i think it's been uh, very well received and i think again a huge part of that is what you helped uh, kind of us see when building out this content and understanding that you can't just talk at someone for six hours you can't just give them 10 videos to watch and you can't just you know jump in front of them and show them how to do something it has to be this blend of different ways addressing different learning um uh, approaches and and also variety is key because um like i said before like you can't just talk at someone for six hours and expect them to get it without giving it a go but then you can't make everyone do it and then not expect to ask questions and so creating areas for people to learn the way they will learn best give them time to process information and to kind of react is a is a key part of that and i think it treads that nice balance or at least what we've been figuring out over the last sort of 12 or so months is like treading that balance even better and accommodating more people basically in their learning yeah no that makes a lot of sense it's interesting just to, yeah just to, to see what your your mindset going into the course i think and, and also that, phil i want to come to you because I mean, when you started on the build with me, I mean, it was the first time you built a data course, wasn't it? You'd done a huge amount of learning design uh, in the past. But I mean, I remember in those initial uh, workshops and we had the post-it notes on the table and it was like, what is, what is Google Analytics for? So I mean, what, what were your thoughts, Phil, about it? Like, what is this thing? <laughs> well, I'm quite conscious that there might be people watching who um, may feel they've tuned into the wrong edition of the podcast because they will know that sort of um, my background is sort of, has a subject specificity around storytelling and film and uh, those sorts of things. And they'll know, Tony, that you sort of like, you know, you work very closely with people who um, perhaps 
identify as delivering creative education and that you know that word so uh, for those people who are, have tuned in and going what is happening is that you haven't tuned into the wrong podcast um but it's it helps me speak to the point about how i felt about you know i i you know i'm not beyond admitting to have some imposter syndrome when i let you down because because you know when you meet another expert sometimes i think some learning designers perhaps worry that they've got to meet that expertise in themselves so they've also got to have that subject expertise in order to add value in order to be useful and i i think having talked to a lot of other people who do this job they sometimes have that same little voice you know that oh my goodness how can i help and you know it became clear quite um early on that this was going to be as creative and as um, it was going to pull on everyone's strengths, actually. It was going to draw down on everybody's sort of, of strengths. And the, the, the thing I really loved and very quickly learned to sort of enjoy about working with you was that you, um, and this is, shouldn't come as a surprise to me, I don't want to make any judgment about people who do data or whatever, but you were in, uh, you had an incredibly creative approach to how this the complexity of your subject could be given away to people more effectively. And so it, I really felt like that as a collaboration, um, it helps prove the idea, really, that creativity, this thing, doesn't exist in creative subjects alone. It's kind of like a mindset piece. And um, I had some, you know, really lovely, you know, brainstorming, proper creative chats with you about how to really leverage the video, but also leverage how you might facilitate those videos. And there was just lots of really great conversations, which I am used to having perhaps with people who are talking more about film or talking more about sort of like, you know, theater or any of those things. So, so that was a big um, um, eye opener for me because I just thought, yeah, actually learning design and a subject matter expert, there's a, there's a lovely thing that happens there. You know, there's a lovely sort of collaboration that happens there. And now I had a great time working with you really. So you just spent quite a lot of time with Daniel on the videos, didn't you? Daniel, did, yeah. a huge amount of videos. And then Phil's like, right, got another four hours of staring at Daniel today. <laughs> Yeah, which I wouldn't wish on my uh, worst enemy, to be honest. But thank you for your hard work on that. Yeah, I think we got to, was it 81 videos in the end? Um, not very long videos, mind you, but 81 separate videos, which was, um, yeah, just a I really liked it feature. because you used to talk to me at the end of your videos. You used to say, hi, Phil. You know, and it was, um, but I just, you know, just going to ask you some questions because some of the, um, <clears throat> obviously, the, some of the people listening, you know, if they're here, wouldn't, won't have seen the videos. But um there was a particular, and I'll, and I'll talk about this one technique because I think it speaks to other things about how you design intentionally and imaginatively with video for sort of um, for your audiences. That one of the big things was that because you know so much about this subject, um, and that every time you went to say something in your training, you sort of had to quantify it with a bit more context. You were always kind of, um, in a way, interrupting yourself with your own knowledge that. that the audience would need a bit more to fully land an idea. Can I ask you just to unpack how you started to use that intentionally as part of the design? So that idea of that you were interrupting yourself, how, how did you uh, ultimately sort of turn that into a technique, into kind of like a USP, in fact, of the videos? How did you, what was your plan around that? Um. It's a really interesting, I think it kind of happened organically or naturally as a way. Um, the, the idea is that, that well, there's twofold. My, my favorite term, which I've used a million times since um, working with you both, um, is the term of off-welding, um, <laughs> which is, it was a bitter pill to swallow, but I completely back it and I completely understand it. And that is the idea that um, just because I find it interesting doesn't mean that everyone else should have to learn it as part of the training program. And I find lots of things fascinating, but technically are not part of a core understanding of what I'm trying to teach someone. And so a very hard pill for a bitter pill for me to swallow is that like everyone should love everything the same way I do. And of course, that's not how people work. So this idea of off-worlding and, and really helping me break down what do people really need to learn or to, to walk away having known. Um, everything else is important and we'll include it, of course, but make it optional content. So um, this idea of off-worlding, we created, um, <clears throat> we call them Dan's Deep Dives as a way of kind of a, a, like a little less formal, uh, more sociable kind of conversations, chatter, maybe some opinions thrown in there too um, about these subjects. And um, what, what we did is rather than let people find them by pinging them a link to a YouTube video or something else like that, 
as we went through the core curriculum, as we went through the core training, I had, um, I always wore a black t-shirt. And so when I interrupted myself, I had a white t-shirt. So that was the white t-shirt, Dan, and this is the black t-shirt, Dan. And um, the, the white t-shirt, Dan, kind of interrupted. And I, so this video of me paused and I interrupted myself in bed and basically said, hey, by the way, did you know there's some more interesting stuff you can look into optionally over here? Here's a link, go here if you want to learn more. And I think that did a really nice job of, uh, of for two reasons. So the first reason is that off-worlding and not throwing everything that I find interesting in front of someone's face, but also allowing them to find it on their own. Um, and the second thing is um, is really breaking up the the kind of cadence of delivery and and having these these pause moments and having these ways of mixing up the format slightly. So rather than let's say you've got a five minute video of me talking about some system that exists within Google Analytics. Um, it's not five minutes of me going, you know, talking, 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 talking. It's these ideas that we can add these sort of like these these brief interludes or these brief seconds to change up the format, and it and it it, it brings back attention. You know, it, it, rather than sitting there and you end up drifting off, you look at this and something is distracting. It's like oh, something's happened, something's different, and and it retrains that attention. So yeah, twofold. It is that off-worlding exercise and letting people know that there is more interesting stuff to learn that we've we've, we've accommodated um, for. And the other one is that kind of that change up uh, to keep the attention and to kind of um, hopefully engage better with the content. Yeah, because you were basically breaking the fourth wall. I mean, if you look at sort of, um, you know, uh, movies where uh, or sitcoms or whatever it is, where the um, um, the surface of the experience is broken and the, tr uh, the you know, the person talking looks out and addresses directly, it, it can seem like a complication because you are addressing people directly on these videos, but you then you sort of interrupted yourself but the the important thing about that the thing i think so important about that was that it it was about intentionality it was that it is very hard to organize knowledge it's really hard to marshal knowledge in fact any curricula is a kind of a um a fake expression of complexity because you know most ideas are layered and they they don't happen sort of in a linear way and 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 all of the conversations we had very early on was like how do you unplat the curricula how do you do that and i like the fact that the the problem um the structural problem became a intentional characteristic of the design of the course um it was a very sweet solution to i think quite a common problem in terms of like curricular design and sequencing which is that it is always a it, you know, a curriculum will always struggle to completely meet the demands of the subject area because the subject area is sort of growing or organic or, or more complicated. But I just think it was a really lovely, intentional, purposeful, engaging and, and charismatic way to solve that problem. And as you say, in terms of what it was doing for people's attentiveness and their engagement, I think it, it had a lot of secondary gain for that. So it was just a, a really creative um satisfying set of solutions um to the to the issue of how do you manage complexity and to be honest with you no disrespect to you but how do you manage the expert because you know uh, often the expert all of that knowledge needing to personify that knowledge get it out sometimes in in our role can be the first threshold concept the first stumbling block often the expert right tony the sort of i would you agree yeah, completely. And, and I think what the nice thing about those videos was that as you got more confident it, uh, in doing that and that the format, as you said, started to evolve and it became more intentional. And I think there was a really important learning design maneuver there, which was this other Dan, I think you ended up calling him a white t-shirt Dan was sort of other Dan came in. And when it when when Dan was sort of, do, sort of talking about something quite complicated, other Dan would just go, hold on, Dan, let's let's just and it, and it almost it gave learners permission to not understand something which i think was such a powerful way to mm. harness the, the the kind of the, the video based medium rather than just being a transmission it was like this other guy went hang on let's just stop this because there's something really interesting here and there's a good chance that the learners aren't going to get it straight away so actually other dan comes in and he's more on the learner's side almost and it was like you were having a conversation with yourself and i just thought i've never seen that done before and i just thought it was, it was a really powerful thing and it, i think it worked really well and what's what's the learner's experience been of this off worlding i mean so you've got feedback but i mean have you or how how have you noticed that they respond to not just the the kind of the pausing but also the off-worlded content is it creating sort of journeys through that for them i, I think so i think so and, and it's really hard to to know the in, obviously the inner workings of someone's brain so i i, I the feedback has always been good um the, the reactions to them and i think um and, and and that's enough for me to know that it's being useful and it is being used and people are finding it useful i think that's 
That's great. I'll tell you what the other aspect of this is, which has been quite interesting that I found actually well, from a from a training perspective or a trainer's perspective more useful is the fact that I've now got stuff to answer questions quickly with. So I don't have to repeat mm -hmm. myself a hundred times. So it doesn't matter if it's in the first week or the sixth week of the course. Um, I'll be like, oh, cool, look, have a look at this. I've, I've addressed this or or here's an idea or here's something to explain. And, and it doesn't matter if, you know, people have missed them, if it's something that I shared in the first week and it's the fifth week. Again, it's this thing that needs to be reiterated and, and time and time again. So, you know, there's always questions of like, um, what does this number mean in this platform in Google Analytics? And I'm like, oh, cool, I've done this done this video about that because there's some nuances there. And rather than me just in whatever format, you know, trying to type it down in Slack or talk to them in a, in a group conversation, I think it enables them to, again, take the time learning this thing um, or get the information they need to a level they want to. Um, and I think, again, that, that idea of choice and letting them kind of go into this information if they want, or again, it doesn't matter if they find it organically, if the if the interrupting Dan doesn't work, I, I'm there as a, as a real Dan, as a third version of myself to then share this stuff with people as they go through this journey as well. I think that's really interesting, because I think, Phil, from when you were back running um, the, the, your course, you used blogs in a similar way, didn't you? You'd have FAQs as a way to speed up answering questions. I would just- Well, I, I just, I mean, as you were talking down, there's something, there's a bit of messaging. I always want to sort of, Put out there because it can sometimes seem i think um because tony and i will always privilege the learner's experience and i think sometimes that um when people who are in the job of delivery so the educators um i think sometimes they can feel a bit like um short changed <clears throat> because it's as if our job is to, to essentially build something in their image but what you remind me that there to say which i end up saying a lot actually is that um there's a quality of life piece there for the person who is delivering because you've just said that actually those FAQs, that kind of Groundhog Day, you know, and there is an element of teaching, um, and you know this, which is Groundhog Day. And sometimes you can't believe you're going to have to say the same thing again, but you are because these people are asking the question for the first time, not you're just hearing it for the millionth time. Yeah. And to speak to the example you made on, on the course that, um, that, I, that I looked after for a long time, we, we had blogs for a whole bunch of reasons, and it only became clear when the sort of the blogging culture had matured that we were producing a kind of a quality of life machine for many of the, the academics because, because of tagging and because of the discoverability of um, answers to repeated questions. There was an automation going on, um, a self-service thing that was going on. And yes, of course, I'm not suggesting that it didn't then mean that sometimes the question came to us anyway. But just as you've said, you could then point people really forensically at a granular piece of detail that you that, uh, that already existed. So I, I just sort of sort of say that, yes, the other thing that your deep dives were doing, I think, were in a way producing the conditions where some of that groundhog factor was being mitigated right and and some so you were freed up to perhaps respond <clears throat> to questions that you couldn't predict or there was a bit more headspace to sort of be a bit more expansive and i absolutely think for for d people who deliver education and work with learners that is not to be underestimated um at all um because teaching can feel like drudgery if you don't perhaps produce some of those resources in a, in a strategic way so so yeah I'm, I'm happy to hear that 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 was that's happening and that that sort of culture of self-serve was was sort of is in place really yeah the other thing i want to ask you about was the measure bot because the, the, another creative way you use video as we were sort of making these videos the, the, this sort of idea evolved for this idea of a measure bot can you explain what the measure bot is and, and what purpose it serves on the course uh, yeah, so the measure bot is a, another another aspect, another kind of not interrupting, but another kind of character that pops up in the videos from time to time. And I think that's because um, within the uh, data space and especially in the marketing world, there's so many acronyms and jargon and terminology that is not only just used, but used in different contexts, meaning different things. And um, <clears throat> what I wanted to do is to create the content of the video to educate them on how to do something, not explaining every acronym, every definition, every word from first principles every time, because that's just going to get long uh, for one long videos. But also I feel like it's going to 
detract from the learning of the thing that the message I'm trying to portray. So uh, whereas interrupting Dan kind of interrupted me by saying, hey, look, there's more on this subject, go learn it over here. The measure bot just popped up at the bottom of the screen or from the side of the screen, just doing definitions really saying, when I when I use the term PPC, um, it means pay-per-click and it means this. And, and so it frees me up to educate in a way that is using the vernacular and use the terminology that, that makes sense to someone that gets it. And it doesn't detract from the experience if you already understand it. But for those people that might be their first foray into this world of, in my world of analytics and marketing, I think it enables them to be on the same pace uh, without feeling left behind or like they, and, and often you hear this, but like they feel stupid because they don't already know something, even though that's the most ridiculous saying, because you're not stupid if you don't know something when you're on a learning course, right? You're in an education course, but people do feel like they should already know something before they go in and do something. So hopefully it addresses that. that oh yeah, I mean, you're, you, you basically feel like an onboarding device in a way. And I think again, um, just to hear you speak there, you know, you've just articulated something that I think not everybody remembers or indeed understands which is that um, learners are a tricky bunch they're they're a tricky bunch because absolutely they will self-punish and self-censor because they don't they've come to do something or come to learn something they don't know but because they don't know it the conditions to feel shame or to feel stupid are high and so their ability to engage with the infrastructure whatever it is um, people can sort of choose to not turn up they can choose to sort of you know um they start to have strange classroom behaviors because they it's like being at school and i i and again um you know I, I, you do a lot of training so you you work face to face with lots of people and I, I just think that some of your um you know some of your sensitivities some of your discussions are, around this you know uh, do do um just align with sort of some of that that learning design stuff that learning designers sort of go in knowing, right, Tony? That that idea about the, the characteristic of the learner, um, how to empathise with them, how to onboard them. Um, um, so I'm going to ask you a question there about because obviously you, you there were these two guys, um, course design. You're an expert. You know your you know your onions. You're really good at it. Um, but in some of our um, conversations, you've talked about how your mind. Sh set has changed a bit and how the sort of building this course and going through it has sort of has sort of given you different insights into uh, education so so what would be your what were your takeaways basically your unexpected takeaways from from um, building a video course I, I it, it kind of changed everything um of how i approach education <clears throat> or building education programs rather so um for, for, for almost 10 years, I've been running training in some form, and I have not come from an education background. I've come from a technical background. I've learned the product on the tool, and my ethos has always been, I need to know everything about it, and then I can teach you how to use it because I can aggregate that information up and decide on what's useful. Um, and, and I still stand by that. I think that's how my brain works, whether I like it or not. I'm aware of that's how I work, and I have to learn things inside and out before I, I would be able to kind of talk about them to with any authority. I think um, the thing for me is that um, I, it, it's changed everything from a perspective of like, you don't have to be a subject matter expert to do a good education course, to, to educate someone else. And, and you need to understand what you're talking about. You can't be a fraud, but you also don't have to be the best person in the world at doing something before you can show someone else how to do something. And I think, again, it's, it's, it's obvious statements to the people in the know, but for when I've, when I've come in at this, I learned through trial and error, through years of doing bad training um, or okay training, figuring out what worked and what didn't work. And so in a sense, I was learning learning design, I was learning delivery mechanisms and processes and tactics um, through getting it wrong. And that's, it just feels so, uh, such the wrong way around of doing things now I've been the other side of that and I, by no means the other side being I'm perfect at doing it now and I've got nothing to learn of course that's not the case um, and, I, and I think where it kind of opened my eyes a little bit is that we at Mesh Lab and the, the 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 kind of core training program we offer is a one-day version of the six-week course and that's where we started from and we've got this one-day thing 
when the world went remote in 2020, um, we then took this and it was always in-person training. You took this one day training program and we tried doing it remotely. I ended up adjusting the schedule, breaking it into two, three hour sessions into modules and stuff. But that's as far as it's really got in terms of a learning time, reacting to something that happened to try to do what we were doing before, but keep it going, keep what we had before, but make it work today. Um, and I think I've just kind of turned that on its head and I, there was a, um, me and my, my counterpart at Meshlab James, um, we've been designing, uh, building out a new education program for data visualization. And so we came at that, not like, oh, let's do another one day training course that we can do in two, three hour calls. And we're like, cool, let's figure out what we need. Maybe it's four hours. Maybe there's Slack involved. Maybe there's videos. Maybe there's homework. Maybe we do some marking. Maybe... Maybe we get them to grade each other and we're just keeping everything open and we're assessing what is going to be the best way for them to learn what they need to learn rather than what's the best way for us to deliver this. And I think it's one thing which is kind of approaching learning design differently, but it's it's made such a difference to how we approach everything. Don't let the format dictate the education because, you know, you don't want to end up building, for example, we're talking about video based learning and building out these video series we've done, but who's to say if we did another version of it, we wouldn't use videos i don't i don't know yet i'm leaving all of that on the table and i think that that's the key thing that has changed is um is just let that path let the learning design guide to that aspect of it and even to my limited kind of um knowledge around learning design i feel like i'm more happy now to be like cool this is a five week course now it used to be one day but it didn't work so it's now five weeks and this one's um uh two hours it used to be six hours but we took out all the stuff you didn't need and now it's two hours and just let it happen and i think it works so much better and and everyone not just the recipient of that but also the trainers as you said before i think we as educators will be happier delivering a course that works where people get value from it uh, rather than forcing something to happen and then being frustrated or annoyed that things aren't sinking in the way you expected them to that's amazing and it, it I suppose when I was running a teacher training course, that was that was always the shift that you were looking to try and help people get, uh, experience or go on was was to move away from I'm going to deliver this stuff to you because I'm the teacher to, and towards I'm going to create the experiences that it best enable the learners to learn. So it's shifting from teacher to learner. So it's, it's wonderful that, that you experienced that. And and it, in many ways, you just answered my final question, which was around what advice would you give to someone who's considering building a like a video based or a training course but i mean that that putting the learner first is obviously one of the most important things in terms of let's build it in the image of the learner what do they need how long does it need to be ideally that's dictated by the learner and you're always having to find a compromise in terms of you know how much resource have you got how much time have you got how many people have you got um but as long as you're trying to put the learner front and center and thinking what do they need um and, and all the things that you've done like the measure bot is is all they're all examples of not forgetting what it's like to be a learner and saying we're going to create an experience that assumes that you don't know about this and or that we're pitching it at the right level so i suppose my final question is is that so what else based on your experience both of, of building the course and of then delivering it uh, for the last year what advice would you give to someone who was thinking of going on a similar journey sort of building a learning product around data or analytics or, or, or something what, what would be your big piece of advice oh um it, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, it, it takes longer than you think. Um, and it's the the idea that, you know, you might end up with four hours of video that might take you 400 hours to design, to build, to edit, to make. Um, and I think you can't expect to just knock something up and make it successful and work. It takes takes time. Um, there are all sorts of methods and tools and we can throw in things like generative AI and all the other stuff to help speed up that process, but it still takes far longer to kind of create the process than it does to the actual final product. So like I said, when you end up with a two hour workshop that took you three weeks to, to figure out and design and test out, that's, that is what can happen. And that is not a bad thing. Um, if I may plug something from you guys, what you guys did for, 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 for me and, um, and my colleagues, I suppose, um, um, through, through that workshop you did at the very beginning. So you mentioned already briefly around this exercise we did with post-its in a room and we got together in London, the three of us in a room for the best part of an afternoon a day going through this exercise. And I think that was the first interaction with you guys in, in a kind of face-to-face -face manner, but also the first start of this journey and beyond having phone calls about it at least. Um, and it was the first time I truly saw like 
learning design as a subject matter ex expertise and um and that's my naivety that hopefully i'm i'm beyond now but it's um to know that that you guys knew nothing of google analytics going in you listen to me who has only done this before one way and has done it through trial and error talk about a subject that you've never come across before and then a week later or two you came back with this mapped out program of six weeks and content and it was just really really impressive and i, and I think it just showed me how little I knew about structuring the content of the things that I already know. And so I think um, if I could give any advice is then it's not just, you know, uh, seek expertise help or, or whatnot, but I think it's take it seriously before you even start doing stuff, creating stuff, recording stuff. It's really important to have that plan, that map to understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, how will it be uh, put together before you start? Um, because the last thing you want to do is start making stuff, realize that it's not working and have to redo it all again, because again, this does take time. Um, whether that's uh, through your services at Ding uh, or, or, or someone you might know that's done this before, or if there's someone you've got a mate that's into learning design, it's always worth getting that kind of that expertise injected right at the very beginning. And I think that makes the biggest impact um, on the whole, the whole process. Thanks, Daniel. That's super useful to hear because, I mean, in many ways, that is the job of the learning designer is to walk into that situation uh, as an imposter and to and to play that card uh, very confidently and say, I know nothing about this. I know how to structure a learning experience. So you need to tell me everything that's important. And then our job as the learning designer is to find a way to sequence it, to figure out what needs to be off-worlded, to figure out what order it might best come in and then check that with you. But yeah, it's a Phil and I always, I think we, we, we often struggle to explain what learning design is to people. That like once you can see it, you see the product of it, it makes total sense. But for, for many people, it is quite mysterious, that bit of like, how do you, what are you doing? You're kind of, <laughs> you, you're pulling it apart. But it's, yeah, like you say, it's so important because you can waste a huge amount of time and effort if you don't do that planning bit at the start. Um, there's, there's there's one other aspect that you just, um, just came to mind. And I think that's... Um... It's the, the realization that, that I had through this process as well. And, and, and again, it sounds obvious in hindsight. And this is the mad thing is you don't know what you don't know. Um, but it's the fact that um, no matter how good your the learning design aspect is, like obviously we're talking about the example of you guys working with myself building out this course. You can't tell me how to teach Google Analytics. I have to lead that. And I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an element there where um, don't go into this. Let's say you, you've booked a session with, with you guys at Ding or, or someone else, and you're going into this process, you're going open-minded. You can't expect this to be outsourced. So you are the expert. You know the stuff better than anyone else. And I can't have an afternoon session with two learning designers and say, go do a six-week course for me. That's not how this works. And so when you mention things like the, the measure bot or uh, the interrupting Dan or these other things, these are things that came out of that and ideas that, you know, collectively we came up with as a group and it's not something that um, can be outsourced. Um, so again, it's this idea that when, when you are going into this process, it's an investment of your, your own time, your own self, and it needs input from you as well. This is not, you know, oh, I've got some experts in, they'll do it. That's not how this works. It is a it pure, it is, it is a true collaboration. Um, and, um, yeah, I think it took me a minute to realize that, that balance of how much and, and how that worked. But once we, we figured that out at the beginning, I think it was, it was great throughout that pro that pro, um, the, the rest of that time together but i just wanted to highlight that to anyone that's going into this like i was fresh that i had to figure this stuff out that it is um yeah fully collaborative daniel thanks so much it's been great talking with you uh, and, and phil and to get, get the that sort of opportunity to review the re review the experience of both the building and the delivering and i'd say to anyone if you're interested in so you doing learning about Google Analytics, then I can highly recommend this course with uh, with Mesh Lab. Not just because we built it, because it's because it was built um, by someone who is incredibly knowledgeable about it and who has now experienced that shift to what do learners need to to know about this subject and what's the best route through that. So, Daniel, Phil, thank you so much for your time today, and um, we will uh, look forward to sharing this with with networks and, uh, and and getting out there. So, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me.